Okay, so here we've got uh, the makings of a new pond. I hope uh, it's a watering hole for the the cows, the uh, grazing cows in BC here are allowed to free range. It's up to us to keep them out. Uh, our fences are down in the entire property, so they come in and they love eating our grass and cabbages and all of our good food crops. So uh, we're, start, we're starting to move them out from the center, from zone one, and uh, this is going to be their watering hole. We want them to be able to have some water when they're here and not bust into our, our uh, this is a pond we dug uh, with a bit of excavator time when we uh, did our micro hydro in our water line for the cabin. So you can now see the base of White Mountain still in the dragon's breath. But we dug a, we have water rights to a spring up there that's not for drinking use, but for uh, agricultural irrigation use. We tapped into that for a future micro hydro line and uh, fixed the water line to the cabin from another spring. And when we had a bit of uh, excavator time here with the big digger, I asked if you would dig this pond here near the aspen grove on the edge. So we know in permaculture, the edge effect is very powerful. What you do at the edge of two different ecosystems is actually magnified because you have two uh, very diverse ecosystems uh, meeting on the edge. And when you do something on the edge, you have both of those systems um, interacting and behaving in ways that we can only begin to understand now. So powerful. Uh, this aspen grove here um, is the edge and the meadow here is the edge and we've got the pond on the edge. Um, so I dug it a bit deeper this year with the backhoe to try and get a bit of a swimming hole for the kids and hopefully a bit of a dunk tank for the future sauna. So it's holding water, uh, that's the good news. Uh, there's no liner, I don't want to use any liner so we're, we're using Sepp Holzer's ideas and Jeff Lawton's ideas to make the natural uh indent a hold water pond dug out and it seems to be working yeah after the rain event now we've got so much water that i created a bit of a spillway and and it's now spilling over to this new little watering hole here that we can flush out for the cows to keep them out of here so but what's exciting here to me is this is the lower end of the acre so water comes off of the mountain and at the highest point, you want to be able, you want to start making cuts along the contour to slow down the migration of that water to the ocean. And we all know now in BC how the forest fires now have taken away the biggest uh, hydro protectors are the trees. These, this forest you see here, this is a young mature forest, you could call it. A young mature and old growth forest, if we can manage to keep them and not liquidate them like we like to do in our short-sightedness. Those trees are huge straws and they, the magnitude of water one of those trees holds is I, I think at the, the amount of a swimming pool of water. Uh, in that phloem, that xylem, that, that those straws that are going up the cambium, uh, sucking water that I don't think physically we know how is possible over, what is it, 30 feet or 100 feet? Shouldn't, it shouldn't be possible, but the trees are able to do it and transpire all that moisture back into the atmosphere. When a forest fire comes, uh, after we've denuded the forest in the last few hundred years and replaced it with a monoculture tree farm, basically a field of wheat that burns in the canopy and, and runs for hundreds of kilometers, hectares, denuding the whole area of any trees, when a rain event happens, that water has no more holding capacity on the earth. The fungus is gone. The root systems, the trees are gone. That water just goes screaming down the mountain, creates huge mudslides, devastates communities, and that water goes to the ocean as fast as possible, leaving us with nothing but a drought-stricken landscape on the road to desertification. So how do you do that? Well, easy. We know it. It's passive systems like permaculture where we got to get in on the landscape. Luckily enough, we still have a forest here. We've been thinning heavily behind the cabin. 
Um, you'll see in other videos how we're starting to separate those trees so the canopies don't touch. So when a forest fire comes, it's a natural thing. It stays on the forest floor. It doesn't get up into the canopy and race along and, and wreak havoc. But there's a lot of work to do. So everybody in the community can start doing that. If you're twiddling your thumbs, wondering why you don't want to wear a mask and rubber gloves to town, then yeah, don't. Get into the woods and let's start thinning and let's start ripping along the contour and creating swales and stopping that water, spreading it, soaking it, and moving it as slowly as possible down to the ocean. So in this little example here, we've got our lowest point right now is this pond. Well, now our lowest point is this little wet spot down here that the spillway's making. Our little swimming hole pond is the next lowest point and we've got some good clay when i dug it out some good clay filled soil that we can start playing with mud bricks and uh forno clay pizza ovens and and then also light clay wall systems for our home but i just came with the backhoe when i we had our first rain event a couple weeks ago it was really wet down here and some of the trees we planted along the the fifth swale at the bottom of the acre were underwater so I got in here as close as I could without getting the backhoe stuck and I, I dug a trench to try and drain that into our pond. And now it's draining. You can see the, the eddy effect of this water now is now oxygenating as it, as it swirls around. It's taking oxygen into our pond. And these swales, you can see now on the outside of the fence, there's a ditch um that the cows don't like going into and they can't get up on that fence and get through that fence it was a quick fence it was the cheapest fence we could do at the time to get up but it works and we just got to keep strengthening it we got to get the deer fence up we got to maybe electrify it for the bears and the cows but i just with my little primitive backhoe i uh came this morning and this is where I couldn't get with the the big the old backhoe so with my little backhoe look at two hoes um, I just hacked out this little trough here this is one of the pleasures that I remember as a child so today being Sunday the Lord's Day a day of rest I thought I'd come and play so I hacked out this little trough and now i'll show you i don't know if you can see all these little cages here but there's a cage every 10 feet or eight feet of uh the uh, trees along the fence and you can see the swales ending there that's as far as the backhoe got and you'll see here up up in the hills there somebody did a logging year years ago and left a bunch of logs in a skid pile for later use i guess and they all went to rot they got these big conks on them and they're full of mycelium see that white stuff there that's mycelium these logs are full of it well i brought them down in the truck and i've been throwing them over the fence now and then the backhoe is going to cover them so these are these are the the heart and soul See that white stuff there? That's mycelium. Right there. Well, that log is full of it. Um, these are the heart and soul of the swale. So this is carbon. It's already well on its way to holding lots of moisture. And uh, when we put it along the... You can see in the back wall there, you know, I've already covered the logs there with the backhoe. So all of those rotten logs are now under dirt and they're going to hold moisture and fungal nutrients uh, as a catalyst for other nutrients for oh, I don't know, a good hundred years I'd say they'll be functional and get this food forest well underway but yeah exciting I connected the dots here with that lower swale where, and I couldn't get in here and I got right up at this top corner what is this the south Southeast corner. Look at how full this swale is. 
it's just it was overflowing down into there and I just blocked it off there and opened it up here with a little bit of work that's the high point and now it's the dots are connected and that pond is now brimming and that's our low point so up here it gets a little of a little bit of a higher point and there's a good shot so the water table is the highest right here in the ground it's just like 16 inches below the surface and now it's draining all the way down to the pond and so there's our white mountain our high point and the water elements coming down to here to our acre and here is so here's swale number five in the makings the trees are in the cages the carbon gets buried on the right side right against the fence the outside of the swale is now a moat a deterrent the cows certainly don't like it uh, the deer can hop it but if i get a wire up high obviously i gotta the corners where i hit with the backhoe i gotta i'm gonna strengthen these corners with some triangles um, and uh, just strengthen the corners um, and then string a wire with flags so the deer can't hop it and then maybe an electric fence so the bears can't get in here either when the fruit starts ripening so that's swale number five this is the first quarter there's swale number four which is basically potatoes down in the swale asparagus and some fruit trees up up in the swale and uh, now that's the rain and the beginning of uh, end of spring and beginning of summers here we've got some chop and drop to do with the cordless weed whacker and the cordless mower and the scythe and the sickle and the back and the hands and the odd curse here and there but it's meaningful work so we're happy for it swale number three uh, these are all crab apple rootstock. There might be a hundred of them in here and this is the second year So this is their creep clear year next year is their leap year and Then we can graft other hardy rootstock Hardy fruits onto that crab apple rootstock Swale number three And this is swale number two. Swale number one and swale number two are the the most active. We, we've, we've invested the most in them at this point. So there's a lot of apples, plums, pears, uh, sea buckthorn, buffalo berry, raspberry, gooseberry, currants. Uh, there's, we grew potatoes in the swale last year, which was uh, really a pleasant surprise because one, we had a big furrow there to plant into and two, it created a nice earth soil that we just planted our garlic into this year. So it's, you can see the garlic doing really good well down the side there. And then if we wanna keep the swale, we wanna re revive the swale, we just gotta go along and dig up all that soil. We can throw it onto the swale or we can use it elsewhere. Uh, yeah, so back to, and we've got some basket willows here along the fence line that we're gonna uh they're in their creep year this year but they'll be in their leap year next year and up at the highest point of the acre is our swale number one it's a real lush part here look at a uh, this because it's a uh, an acre that's kind of following the the road into the homestead this uh is not on contour so it's kind of an uphill swale but there's so much water coming this year the swale is full of water so if you guys are familiar with jeff lawton and and uh, some of his good videos uh the the water lens that's created here the water goes into the swale we've got our carbon buried here and that once these perennial crops start to hydro cycle they start to pull up lots of water into their big trunks they start to bring water up into the swale and they create this water lens underneath the swale which raises the water table and now 
in our quarter acres, we uh, have a water lens starting here in acre one. And that water lens now filters through down to swale number two, which is another water lens. And when we went to the Kermetterhof last year in Austria to visit Sepp Holzer's uh, old homestead of food forest, uh, his son is now running it, Joseph. And I asked him, you know, there's no irrigation here. Well, how, do you, how are you guys growing all these crops? And he says, well, the water table is so high because of the swales, all of the perennials, we don't usually have to irrigate. We uh, sometimes will irrigate in a dry year with a pump in a pond, but usually we don't, and the, there's enough moisture in between the swales to do all the annual cropping you need without any irrigation. So super exciting on that note as well. Anyways, 